In 1917, when this French priest died, a secret was buried in his grave. A secret which had led him to an incredible fortune. A secret which apparently he had found concealed within this stone pillar. From utter poverty, he was able to build himself this grandiose tower, merely to house his library. Enormous sums of money were lavished on the redecoration of his tiny church, where, in every detail, the priest seems to be giving clues to his treasure secret. And some clues he hid from us. He erased the inscription on this gravestone. This is what he found in the hollow pillar. Parchments. For him, they led to a treasure. For us, who wish to follow in his trail, they are the beginning of an extraordinary and wide-ranging story. Jerusalem, the Danish island of Bornholm, the eastern foothills of the Pyrenees. Three points marking out a great triangle within which lay most of Christendom in the Middle Ages. They will prove to be locked together in one of the most extraordinary mysteries to have surfaced in the 20th century. Already we have been led down strange pathways. We have encountered the medieval fighting monks, the Knights Templar, and the devil has raised his head. For the Templars were accused of heresy, of worshipping a devil, and Sonier the priest put this fearful devil into his church. We seem to be confronting the ungodly, or perhaps we should say the unchristian. Here in the Languedoc, we are in the heartland of a medieval heresy which the Roman Church put down with bloody ferocity in a crusade which ended here at Monsegur in 1244. These heretics were the Catars, the Albigensians. Like the Templars, the Catars too were accused of denying Christ crucified and worshipping the devil. In March 1244, the last of the Qatars were besieged here at the castle of Montségur. And when all hope seemed lost, they asked for a two-week truce. Surprisingly, it was granted to them, but no one was to enter or leave the castle on pain of death for the entire garrison. And yet, the Qatars helped three men to escape. And three men can't have carried very much. Not when they had to scramble down a sheer mountainside on the end of ropes and in the dead of night. What could they have been taking? It said that it was the treasure of the Qatars. And it said that that treasure included the Holy Grail. The Qatars held that God was not the omnipotent creator of all things. They believed that the physical universe was created by a god of evil, Rex Mundi, lord of the earth, whose image Sonia had placed in his church. But to acknowledge the power of the devil is not necessarily the same as to worship him. Perhaps Beranger Sonia was continuing the faith of his heretical 13th century forebears. But again, we're being drawn back into the realm of legend myth, uncertainty. If the confusions are not to grow more confounded, we must find, if we can, a concrete clue. And it is the devil who will help us. The key to the hidden meaning of this statuary group lies above his head in these two strange and unreal little beasts. They are salamanders the mythical creatures who were supposedly born out of fire, the elemental spirits of fire. And between the devil, lord of the earth, and the symbols of fire is the holy water. And above, crowning all, there are angels, creatures of pure spirit or air. Earth, water, 
fire, air. The four elements, so strong a part of the teachings of the Kabbalists, astrologers, and alchemists of the Middle Ages. But why is Sonia, a 20th century priest, giving us this nudge towards such a curious piece of medieval thinking? Is he trying to distract us with the suggestion that his wealth came from alchemy? For most of us today, alchemy is no more than a bizarre belief that it was possible to convert base metals into gold. The true alchemist's search was for a means of changing base man into pure spirit, a religious concept, and as such, as a way of understanding the adept's view of the world, it merits our attention. The Qatars, remember, were accused of heresy, and the Templars also were accused of heresy, of denying Christ and trampling on the cross and worshipping a devil. It is interesting from our point of view to note that the Church also moved against Sonier in his later years. He was even, for a while, suspended from his duties. Can he have been dabbling in heresy? Sonier put the devil, Lord of the Earth, in his Church for a purpose. We must look again at his actions and motives then we may understand what exactly it was that he believed. We must look once more at the parchments which set him on his strange course. We've already found the simple childish code of raised letters. This treasure belongs to King Dagobert II and to Zion. But of course, the documents conceal much more than this. There is this curiously untidy mark, an arrow, N for North, and what can N-O-I-S mean? But look at the bottom arrowhead. It's an A upside down. Turn it upright and we can read S-I-O-N, Zion, Jerusalem. And look at these tiny letters. There are eight of them and they spell Rex Mundi, the devil, Lord of the Earth. What next? Again, the same key word, childishly hidden. But such games are only to attract attention, to say, keep looking. On this document, there are three meaningless little crosses. But look, if you draw this line, S-I-O-N, we must be on the right trail. Where will it lead? A tiny triangle at the top right seems as meaningless as the crosses, is it? Watch. The parchment conceals a geometric design. What significance can it have? The obvious significance, the one which most people today will recognise, links us back to devil worship. Magic, the occult. When a magician wishes to raise the devil or summon spirits, he does so within the protection of the five-pointed star. It is his focus of power. So now we must ask again, was Sonier a worshipper of the devil? When Sonier built his library tower, he called it La Tour Magdala, the Magdala Tower, an acknowledgement of the importance to him of St Mary of Magdala, Mary Magdalene, to whom his church is dedicated. And for the medieval students of the occult, for the astrologers, the alchemists, the initiates, Mary Magdalene was the medium of a secret revelation. She was the first to transmit the knowledge of the risen Christ and so she held a special place for those initiates of the occult. And they accorded her a special symbol in the heavens, and that symbol was the planet Venus. 
to our ancestors, the world was a very different place. For them, for instance, the Earth was the centre of the universe. As they watched the planets circling in the heavens, they saw that there came moments when the Earth, the Sun and a planet would be in perfect alignment. These alignments could be plotted and foretold, and each planet had its own unique pattern. For instance, Mercury aligns three times in its orbit and forms an irregular triangle. One planet only makes a perfect geometric form in the heavens, and that is Venus, the Magdalene, symbol of the secret revelation, visible only to those with the occult, the hidden knowledge. That pattern is a pentacle, the five-pointed star so ingeniously concealed in Saunier's parchment. Venus, the pentacle, the Magdalene, patroness of the treasure village. What light can she shed on our mystery? Curiously, like the Catars, she too is closely connected with the Holy Grail. Legend tells us that after the crucifixion, Mary Magdalene fled from the Holy Land, bearing with her the Holy Grail. And that mystic chalice she supposedly brought to France. For some people, the Grail is a metaphor for the Philosopher's Stone. That quasi-magical substance sought so ardently by the alchemists. Is this the link we are looking for? Perhaps, but already we can see that clues which appear to be unrelated yet have some hidden and connecting thread. For the moment, let us hold on to that connection between Venus, the Magdalene, and the Pentacle, that geometric form to which we were led by the Pentacle in the parchments. Perhaps those mysterious documents have yet more to show us. Here, a reader of Latin will immediately notice something strange. The words are regularly broken by extraneous letters, 140 of them. These letters constitute an incredibly complex cipher, utterly unbreakable without the key. Fortunately, the key has survived, and so we can unravel the message. What does it say? Berger, pas de tentation que Poussin tenier garde la clé. Pax 681. Par la croix et ce cheval de Dieu, j'achève ce démon de gardien à midi, pomme bleue. Shepherdess, no temptation, to which Poussin tenier hold the key. Peace 681. By the cross and this horse of God, I complete this demon guardian at midday, blue apples. More mystery, more confusion. But wait, not everything here is ambiguous or meaningless. Poussin and Tenier hold the key, a simple statement. But how can Poussin and Tenier, two great painters of the 17th century, hold the key to this mystery? Shepherdess and No Temptation help us to make the first step. When Saunier found his parchments, he sought help with the codes from experts in Paris. There, at the Louvre Museum, he bought copies of paintings by these artists. The Tenier, unfortunately, leads nowhere, because the original of the painting which interested Saunier is now lost. But the Poussin is his most famous picture, The Shepherds of Arcadia. And here is the shepherdess. In company with three shepherds, she contemplates a tomb in a tranquil Arcadian setting. The inscription they are reading says, Et in Arcadia ego, even in Arcady I, death, am present. And now suddenly and unexpectedly, we are taken back to the gravestone of the 18th century Grand Dame de Blanchefort last descendant of the Templar Grand Master, Bertrand de Blanchefort. Remember, when Saunier made his discovery, he took pains to erase the writing on this gravestone. His efforts were wasted. The inscription had already been copied. Here is the writing which Saunier took such pains to obliterate. 
these two lines are all that need concern us. We must simply change the letters from the Greek to the Roman alphabet, and now we can read et in Arcadia ego, the phrase written on the tomb in Poussin's painting which Sonia did not wish us to see. Why not? Art experts have always insisted that this is a picture of an imaginary tomb in an imaginary landscape, but they are wrong. Within sight of Sonia's hilltop village is this, or rather, it was. Sadly, the structure was destroyed in 1988. But even with the tomb gone, nothing can alter or remove the background. And here, not imaginary, but very real, is the landscape that Poussin painted. This is the flank of the mountain of Cardu. This is the crest of Blanchefort. And this is Rennes-le-Chateau. Why did Poussin paint the precise landscape of this area? Did he know anything of the secret of Rennes-le-Chateau? It seems that he may well have done, for he too has used his artistry to conceal the same potent image which was hidden in the parchment, the image which reflects the movements of the planet Venus, the Magdalene. With great care and precision, he has built his design upon the mystic pentacle whose centre lies as if radiating from the mind of the shepherdess. What curious road is this that we are following? Always we are led back to a mystic symbol and to Rennes Chateau. What sort of secret is this? And is there any evidence that Poussin may have known it? Well, in April 1656, Poussin received a visit from a French priest. He was the Abbe Louis Fouquet, brother to Nicolas Fouquet, superintendent of finances at the court of Louis XIV. The Abbe Fouquet then wrote a letter to his brother, the king's minister. In it he said, Monsieur Poussin and I discussed certain things which will give you advantages which even kings would have great pains to draw from him and which it is possible that nobody else will ever rediscover in the centuries to come. So Poussin did possess a secret, a secret that kings would have pains to draw from him. And presumably, Nicolas Fouquet in his turn learned that secret. And then, at the height of his power, when his wealth enabled him to rival even the king in the splendor of his lifestyle, Fouquet was suddenly arrested. He spent the last 20 years of his life in prison. The king, it is said, personally went through Fouquet's papers. And, interestingly for us, he then took pains to acquire Poussin's Shepherds of Arcadia. But the painting was not put on public display. It was kept locked away in Le Petit Appartement du Roi. Shut away, a secret. Dagobert, Zion, the Templars, the Pope, Poussin, Fouquet, and now the King, and eventually Saunière. What sort of secret slowly seeps down through the centuries, always remaining a secret, kept and passed on, never leaking out, guarded always as privileged information? Strangely, the parchments hint at such a secret, this Bible passage tells of Jesus and the disciples walking in the cornfields. Innocent enough. But notice the last two words have been separated. Solis sacerdotibus. And above those two words, two others, which stand out to a reader of Latin. They do not belong to the Gospel text. They are not even in the Latin tongue. Redis ble. Ble is French. It means corn. In familiar language, it is sometimes used as a slang word for money, gold, treasure. And Redis is another of the old names for Ireda Rennes le Chateau. Redis, Ble, Solis Sacerdotibus. The corn of Redis Ireda is only for the priesthood. 
or the treasure of Rennes le Chateau is only for those who are initiated. Solis sacerdotibus, only for the initiated. This begins to resemble the classic scenario for a secret society. But do such things really exist? We have all heard of the Freemasons and of the mysterious Rosicrucians of the early 17th century. But if a society were truly secret, well, should we even have heard of it? On the parchments, there are these cryptic letters, P.S. On the gravestone, P.S. Now look at this. This calvaire was erected by Sonia in his church garden. On it, he has written some innocent, pious phrases. On the front, Christus winket, Christ conquers. On the sides, Christus imperat, Christ rules. Christus regnat, Christ reigns. But on the back, we have this. Christ defend what? A-O-M-P-S. What can these letters mean? A-O-M are familiar in the world of esoteric groups, such as the modern Rosicrucians. They stand for Antiquus Ordo Mysticusque, the ancient and mystic order. And again we have P-S. What ancient and mystic order is this? In the archives of the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, this extraordinary document has come to light. On it, a list of names, some famous, many obscure. Names such as Leonardo da Vinci and Isaac Newton, famous English scientist of the 17th century. And also Nicolas Flamel, the most renowned alchemist of the Middle Ages. And most surprising of all, the last three names, Victor Hugo, Claude Debussy, Jean Cocteau. This list claims to be of the Grand Masters of a secret society, an order whose name is the Priere de Zion. P.S. Antiquus Ordo Mysticusque Prioratus Zionis. This treasure belongs to Dagobert II and to Zion. Perhaps Zion does not, after all, refer to Jerusalem, but to this mysterious Priory of Zion. And according to this document, the Priory of Zion is the true founder and originator of the Knight Templar. The threads of our mystery, which seemed so unconnected, are being drawn together. But wait. People may say anything. Documents can be concocted. And isn't this just the sort of list a secret society might invent to give itself an illustrious pedigree? Or could this document possibly be genuine? Proof of the existence of a body of knowledge which has been passed down through the centuries. Knowledge which has never leaked out. Truly a secret society. The next steps in our investigation will find the firm ground upon which we must tread in order to follow this pathway of clues to its end. And that pathway has yet more startling twists along its way. <laughs>